is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zenker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I'm your host. And today we're going to talk about leadership. Leadership is so important in leading and building high performance teams. So that's what every leader wants to do, but unfortunately, sometimes they fall short. So we're going to talk about the tips and tricks in order to make that happen. And I'm excited to have an expert in this space with me. Obviously, I look for all the greatest people for you guys to be able to pick their brains and through me. And Margie Olson is a dynamic executive coach and leadership virtuoso (laughs) armed with a doctorate in organizational development. With a strategic blend of expertise and innovation, Margie empowers leaders and their teams to forge robust foundations for collaboration and productivity. And at the heart of her legacy lies Top Team Accelerator, a transformative force driving senior leaders and their teams to master change and drive enduring advancements in diverse industries from aerodynamics to fintech. So without further ado, Margie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Penny. So tell us your story. Tell us how this became a passion for you and why you're focused in this area. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. One is that I had been in organizations for decades and I went back and earned a doctorate. And for the four years that I was doing my coursework, I figured out that we've known all that we need to know about the art and science of leadership, effective teams, high-performing teams. And that had been for 30 years. So a lot of the books, the audio, the different ways that you can learn about high-performing teams, they were all based on some very common principles that were 30 years old. Now we're at 40 years. So when I chose my dissertation topic, it was sort of like, what the heck? I had been in companies for so long, organizations of every possible type, for-profit, non-profit, government, And I just did not understand why it was so such a struggle for leaders and their teams. So I wanted to understand that. So I went through the process of realizing that it's about the way that organizations do the work that they do and how they're set up. Imagine the complexity when you bring two or three people together, the energy exchange, the frequencies, the feelings and the history and the needs will make that 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 or thousands. And companies know to prioritize legal, hire someone who's an expert on legal. They know to prioritize finance and make bring someone in who's an expert, but they think they're supposed to know how to lead. And our first leader is the person that raised us from a baby. And our first team is anyone who's living in the house. So we learned a lot of the automatic pilot responses, even after a lot of education and experience we're still sort of operating on that autopilot of how we learn. And then those people then go into organizations and whatever leader they had, whatever teams they're on, if they've not participated in a high-performing team, if they didn't have a high-performing leader, we were just going to learn to continue those behaviors. So I was in corporate America for decades and I looked around and I just didn't want to be in those places where so much time was being wasted. 30 to 60 minute meetings all day long and everyone's complaining about it and the ball's not moving down the field much and projects are delayed a year and they're spending millions and millions of dollars and they don't realize they actually can save a lot of time, save a lot of resources, make it better by doing the certain things that the art and the science tell us to do. Right. Wow. So let me unpack some of that, what I heard, because there were some nuggets in there and I wanted to stop and interrupt you, but you were on a roll there. So You said the first people that we learn from, right? The first leaders in our lives are our parents, which is very interesting because, of course, there is no book on how to be a parent, right? So, I mean, there are plenty of books, but every child is different and every situation is different. And I guess there are some really good parallels to leadership in that. And we are leaders as parents, but there was no formal training for for most people. Most people don't pick up a book and you're not qualified to have a baby. (laughs) So, that's an interesting thought and concept, right? And then in school, we're not taught 
some of those basic types of leadership skills, either Correct. Have been taught really time management. Correct. Format. So I think that's really interesting that there's a lack of a basis that we have. And many people don't have mentors and they don't have the example that's set that they can see how it's done. So yes. I just want to reiterate what I heard there. And yes. It's important to pull that out. So the science you said is there. It is. But I also thought I heard you say that the books were all written about science from 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. So are you talking about the new science? Is there new I'm, science? I'm talking or- about implementation. And so the information is there. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the leadership development training that I was familiar with, consultants would come in or HR would host trainings or leaders would hire someone. It was really in the classroom, but it wasn't the kind of thing that was going to actually teach you how to lead, but it was going to be based on those theories. But then what happens is it falls down in practice. It's no different than other things that we're trying to change. So our brains do almost everything on autopilot to keep us safe and be ready. And so Habits are probably one of the single greatest advantages that you can focus on to make change for yourself here at home, but then also in the organization. So we talk about the habits for poor meetings, the habits for having the too big a teams or not leading or having too many of the problems being solved over and over again. So there are just some things that we know from science and we want to benefit from it and use what we know about how to implement effectively. Absolutely. I want to come back because that's a really important point is most of what we learn in a lot of different areas is theory. And right. the theory falls down very often in practice. So I used to be in application development mm. and you'd learn the code and mm. you'd go and you'd code something and then it wouldn't work. And you'd have to write in workarounds mm-hmm. to get it to work because that's practice. That's correct. That's your goal is to get it to work is not just to write it the way that it's supposed to be written. So. I think it's really important. I think we see that in a lot of different areas. And I think that the trainings that we do, and and I'd be interested in your feedback on that, but I think the trainings that we do are antiquated because they Mm -hmm. are based on the theory and there's not enough practical application that goes on in that. And so, and then also people go back into their day to day and they go back to the way they were doing things because it doesn't fit. They don't know how to adapt. That's exactly it. They can do it for a little while and they'll say, well, we tried that and it didn't work but they don't realize that they actually went back to the old ways and they just didn't even necessarily notice. Mm, Right. We do that, right? We're creatures of habit and we go back to old habits. Mm -hmm. So the brain is doing that. So we want to lead the brain. The brain is doing it because that's how it's wired. So we want to work with it to help make it okay to make those changes. So what are some tips to get ourselves Mm -hmm. into that place where we're driving the organization, teaching the leaders, Mm -hmm. where do we start? Is it how the leaders show up or is it how Mm -hmm. they're leading their team? I never was comfortable with the idea of top-down leadership, but I can't argue it's top-down. It is top-down. It's kind of like the adults in the household. They have to get their act together first and everything else flows out of that. I learned in my research that you can be a high-performing team somewhere in the middle of the organization and manage for about 12 to 18 months. But at some point, you're going to change or your team is going to change or your leadership, you're going to need some budget or you're going to need some reinforcements. And so you're going to be at the mercy of the culture. So it starts at the top. And so I have Top Team Accelerator is four pillars that take a year because we spend several months really learning how to do high performing teams, how to develop trust among the leadership. So leaders are leading and they didn't think it was going to be like this. They didn't think they were going to feel like a babysitter. They didn't think people would come and gossip to them or complain to them. They didn't think they were going to have to solve the same problems over and over again. They don't feel comfortable talking about that openly. They may say something behind the scenes. They may not, but this is what's happening with a lot of them. And so we help them. The first thing we do is build the team, reduce those bad behaviors. You don't fix trust by focusing on trust. You fix trust by doing the work, setting up your systems and processes, and then do it in a way where the things that are going well and the behaviors that are positive that lead to trust are reinforced. And then I'm there to observe and to help practice for the things that need to change. And then we move into them understanding what the actual work is and who should be working on what. And they agree with it, even if it's not what they would choose. 
But Lencioni, Patrick Lencioni, Five Dysfunctions, once said, if you can get everybody in the organization rowing in one direction, you would dominate your industry. And I agree with that because he's seen all those teams and they're not doing it. Most of the companies aren't because people will be on a leadership team and they'll just go back and lead their own team in their own way, either because they're frustrated or they're worried or they don't want to really do the things that we're focusing on now. So we get them aligned and make sure that they're rowing their teams in their direction. And then we look at today's operations. The fact that most everyone struggles with their meetings, and that's really one of the easiest things to fix. So I've worked with clients and they fix them right away. And then it all goes back to the old ways because they don't keep it going. And they actually don't necessarily follow the few things. And I haven't figured out if it's because it's not sexy enough or they don't have someone looking over their shoulder. So we spend months getting accustomed to how to make this happen. And there are elements of politics that get in the way. So we can't fix our meetings because we always have to have that person in the meeting, even if it's not for them to be there. So we have open conversations about that with leaders and to develop their team so that they can reduce the politics, reduce the confusion. And then the last thing we do is put metrics in place that are the short list of the things you really watch to know how you're doing. And they include behavior metrics. So let's break it down because I want to make it so that there are tips. You're talking about a lot of things that are four months, six months, and a year. And I actually believe we can change things actually rather quickly. So Mm -hmm. it sounds like we may have a differing of opinion in that, but let's start with meetings, right? Sure. Because I think meetings is something that everybody pulls their hair out over, complains about, and is a great wasted source of time. So what are some of the things that you are recommending to your leaders to do? Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about why they're difficult to do and how to overcome that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, plan. So the first thing we do is just implement the things we know, the science and the art of meetings. So number one, you really need to have an idea of what the purpose is for the meeting and everyone who's in it needs to know that. And then you only want the right people there that are for that conversation. And that means make sure you have the right people there that are needed and make sure you don't have anybody extra. And then we always separate out tactics from strategy. And so if you have a tactical meeting where you're really talking about the operations this week, it's putting out fires and solving problems, but you invite that person that's always being strategic and they're really not needed anyway, and they bring up a long-term strategy and all of a sudden you're off to the races down a rabbit hole. And so it sounds so simple. It's really unfortunate that it's not rocket science. But if you can do just those few things, and then by the end of the meeting, let's say it's a 25-minute meeting, you stop three minutes before, and you just say to people, okay, so somebody owns this, here's what we decided, say it out loud, here's what the questions were that came up that still need to be answered, and here's what the follow-up actions are. Those things that I just described, I would say 97% of people's meetings don't go like that. And so when you don't have those pieces in place, People go off and they don't do their piece because they didn't remember, or they do something and it's not exactly what you said, or you have to have three more meetings to rehash all of the things that you came up with because people weren't engaged. And then there's the meeting after the meeting because people Before are like, I didn't after. agree with that. And they didn't say what they needed to say at the meeting. Yep. So there And are- so I would say the reason it takes months is because people will implement those practices. And actually leaders can look around their teams. There are people who are really good at this stuff. They don't really have the power, but if you create space for them, they'll be the ones to make this happen for you. But what happens is power takes over and all of a sudden we have a crisis and all of a sudden, oh yeah, we said we were going to do purpose and agenda. We're not doing that right now. And then they don't ever quite get back to it. And I think it's because they have not re, James Clear says, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your habits. And so I would say the adage culture eats strategy for breakfast, I think habits eat our goals and our desires and our strategy for breakfast. So you have to do the work to develop high-performing meeting habits, everyone together. So some of the things that I've learned, like I just want to pull out some of the things that you said, 25-minute meetings, right? So what we're trying to avoid there is the back-to-back-to-back-to-back meetings because that is wasting people's times. It's draining their energy. They're not getting a chance to take a break in between meetings to actually write down the follow-up or clarify and do a brain dump so that they can then prepare for the next meeting. So, And you can set up Outlook to default to that. Outlook will help you with that. So when I go to schedule a meeting in Outlook, it defaults to those shorter meetings. And then I would change it if I needed to. Sure. And like you said, if we were to be very specific and purposeful about our meetings, and if we have a status update meeting, that's 
only status update. If we have a brainstorming meeting, it's a brainstorming meeting. If we have a strategic direction, so we have to be very clear not to intermingle meeting types that you accomplish one thing in the meeting in terms of the type of meeting that it is. And that could be if you're going down a list to say, okay, is it this type of meeting? Okay. That helps you determine who should be there. So I like- And for your listeners who might be skeptical, they could just notice now for the next several meetings, notice how many times those elements are present and in many times they're missing. Well, and also that we need to have forms and structures to make that happen, right? So I know a lot of organizations who are really looking to improve their meetings after every meeting, they do a review so that that leader is reviewed on the quality Mm -hmm. of their meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's anonymous. So, and that's one way to hold them accountable and give them ownership. I recently saw some things that I think are also important that we take into account where we are today, right? So I just read that, and I just did it this morning in an event where Jeff Bezos, he knows that people are busy and they have a lot going on and they did just come from another meeting. So he gives them five minutes in the beginning of each meeting to read the agenda and to read the purpose of things that are being, so that they're prepared and then they can have that discussion. Nothing wrong with that. I think that is perfectly identifying what the challenges are today for people and taking ownership and responsibility so that our meetings are more effective. Why not look at those things? How do we use AI, right? For virtual meetings, we see it where they're highlighting certain parts of the meeting and things, right? So we have to also make sure that we're using the tools that are available to us and understanding what people's needs are. Brene Brown does a one word check-in emotionally. Where are we emotionally? So that we can say, get that off our chest. I'm frustrated. Okay. Now that I've said it, I can settle into this meeting, right? So there's different tips and tricks with meetings that I found that really help to make those meetings more effective. Have you seen any of those other types of little? Yes. And what Yep. And what I've seen, so I typically do that. I'll do a check-in, but also what we want teams to get to is a level of transparency that is comfortable for the first period of time. So we ought to be able to say out loud to each other, do we have everybody that should be in this conversation? And also, do we have people here who don't need to be here? Nobody wants to say that, but it really can help your effectiveness. If you can free flow and say, hey, oh, I don't need to be in this meeting. Great. I'll talk to you later. Rather than I'm taking it personally, or I'm worried you're going to talk about things and I'm not there. And how are you going to be successful without me? Or I really want to talk about that strategy, even though this is a tactical meeting. So if we can be open and honest, the other thing I recommend is use your strategy discussions where you're away from the day to day to check in on how your meetings are going. Take a little bit of generous time, go around and talk with your leadership team about what's working well. Because you are going to get some things right away. It's those stubborn challenges that you're going to have to give a little more attention and love to. And that is the piece where people then exit and they don't turn it into a habit. But when you can address those challenges and start to get the habit of being open, if you can take an hour to talk about your meetings when you're not at a meeting that has to have other stuff done, you will start to customize those tips and tricks for what's really going on with you and develop new habits. Hmm. And you have to hold each other accountable. That's what it is, is you have to have an environment that you're able to challenge one another. And that's in a loving way, right? In order to focus on the right thing, solve the right problem. It's okay to ask a question. Are we solving the right problem? What is, let's just step back and and see what that problem is. So I think that Mm -hmm. what you said there is important permission to challenge. Hopefully they're not going to show up to the meeting. They'll challenge it before they show up to the meeting and not waste people's time in the meeting. And that's Mm -hmm. also a personal responsibility that I think that people have is to address those types of things before and outside the meeting. And so I would also say another tip and trick is we're struggling around video. So if we're doing a lot of virtual, I have spent time in organizations where no one is on video in any of the meetings, Mm -hmm. except for um, higher level up. And it's not an all or nothing. But if you're really wanting to grow high performing meetings, you want to work together to figure out what is right for you. If you are never on video and if you're never in person, you are missing that energetic exchange. That's just a fact of life, whether you believe in that kind of science or not, that's just a fact. And so you will have different outcomes and how are you going to overcome that? But when people are not on video, I think we think that we're doing them a favor or helping them, but actually they're more productive and can be more engaged if at least some of the conversations are strategically designed to be more engaging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's for sure, right? That we need to strategically 
engage in our meetings because otherwise you're going to have people who are multitasking. And like you said earlier, yes. you have to repeat or have a meeting after the meeting because yes. they weren't paying attention. And that's a waste of everybody's time. So when we talk about high performing teams, is there anything else that you wish that I would ask you that I haven't asked you yet? Well, I think that the leader, him or herself, really looked forward to being a leader and it doesn't feel like what they thought it was going to be. And they just think that's how it is. I wish that they, most leaders would understand that it is possible. It is happening. They're not hearing about it at pickleball. They're not hearing about it with their mentor or in other groups or at dinner. They have not been on a high performing team or had a high performing leader. So they think it just doesn't happen. They've had consultants come in, they've had coaches and it just didn't happen. So they think it doesn't happen or someone else should make that happen. The truth is it can happen. We know what we need to know. Now open yourself up to being able to spend the investment of time and energy, step a little bit back away from the crises, away from the day to day to focus on building a future for yourself that's weeks out. And it really does start to become habits because we can offer the knowledge and the practice and it's awkward. It's awkward to make changes. It's awkward to be called on about your behavior. It's awkward to call someone, hold them accountable. But once you build trust, develop support and collaboration in the ways that we know how to do that, it really is easier and then can become more second nature. And the clients that I have seen have this happen, they would never want to go back to the old ways. Right. Great. What was the single piece of greatest advice that you got as a leader? Well, I heard a lot of advice that was not helpful And maybe the single greatest piece of advice I heard was to trust my instincts and verify. So I'm intuitive. And so I have answers, but I don't necessarily know if they're correct. And I don't necessarily know how I got them. So I have learned to go with my intuition and then seek answers, seek outside experts to be able to do a cross check. And I would say that's the other thing I've learned becoming an entrepreneur is We don't get there by doing it alone. We don't get there doing it all ourselves. And that took me the longest time to learn. I am supposed to do it myself. I'll add people or I'll add help. I'll look for help later. No, we need help now. And leaders, they can get the help they need so they can do the kind of leading they want to do. Very good. And last question is, how do you define productivity and why? Mm. So productivity is the idea that you are able to do the things that you do for the goals that your leader has based on your role. And so it's not necessarily being busy all day. It is, I was hired for this role. I am clear how my leader sees I fit into the goals of what our team is doing. I know what my part is. My leader has made sure that I have everything that I need to do that. And my leader knows how it's going. And so for me, we are hardwired to have this internal satisfaction when we know that we're adding value. So it's not that I'm busy all day because we can feel in our gut that that doesn't feel right. But when I know that I'm busy and I can see where it's adding value, and I also know how someone thinks I'm doing, that is when employees have uh, a lot of productivity, a lot of engagement. They even get joy out of that, which we don't necessarily talk about a lot. And it sounds like there were a couple pieces that you had said in there. My leader knows how to give me what I need. and My leader knows what I need to be doing. I think just to spring back, and I'm sure this is what you mean as well but that we also need to manage our leaders and help our leaders, right? So that if we know what we need, then we need to ask for it if they're not asking the right question. So it's a two-way conversation. We can't expect them to know what we need if we're not communicating. Because I hear a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know, my leader just gave me something else to do and I can't do anymore, but I took it on anyway. And now I'm burning out. Mm -hmm. Like, That's on you too, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we have Mm -hmm. to understand that if you have to hold your hand up, your leader might not know all the things that you're doing. Correct. You hold your hand up and say, hey, look, here are the top priority things that I have. And so there has to be that give and take conversation so that they can say, oh, well, this is going to be more important than this. So let's put this aside for now. And you can't wait till the quarterly or the annual. It needs to be very informal and very engaging. And I like leaders to think, what do I need to do so that I am connected to my people and they do feel comfortable telling me those things? Yeah. And just asking more quality questions. Do you need anything? I find, or the questions that go at that surface level often don't trigger people to think about what they really need. 
Correct. So by asking more effective quality questions, I think also we get to a little bit more of the nuance and then people are like, oh, I could use that. Or I don't know what the circumstance is, right? But it could be something at the next level of with a little bit of detail. And after a few of those instances, it starts to become okay. It starts to feel oh, I kind of know how to do this. Both people start to be a little bit more open and are faster um, time savers to get to the information and be able to move forward. It's like it builds up momentum and habits when you really feel like it's okay. And you're learning to do that in a new way. Great. Well, how can people reach you? So um... so I'm at Olson. So Olson has a silent E, O-L-E-S-O-N-consulting.com where you can download a case study, see Top Team Accelerator videos. And I'm also on LinkedIn, Margie dot, M-A-R-G-I-E dot O-L-E-S-O-N. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Margie, for being oh, here. Oh, nice to meet you, Penny. And thank you all for being here, right? That's our goal is to help you to be better leaders, to challenge your people, to bring their best, Right. And why not just start with meetings? If you have effective meetings, I think that's going to cover probably a good 50%, if not 75% of your day. So that's pretty powerful. So we heard some great tips, some things to think about to step back. My reset moments is a reset moment. Let's reset our meetings. Step back. Think about how you're currently running your meetings, what's working, what's not working, and then start shortening them. Make them 25 minutes, make them very specific for the content that you're talking about and double check, are we having the right people? Could you skip the meeting altogether and just send an email out, right? Be more thoughtful, challenge every single meeting. I think Disney at one year, this was probably more than 10 years ago, they cut all meetings. They said no more meetings and they said we can slowly add them back, right? But it didn't go all the way back. They were very purposeful about, okay, Do we need to meet? What are we meeting about? Why are we meeting? What's our result that we want? And so that's what you want to do too. So check out Margie's website and her information and get to work. My name is Penny Zinker and I'm your host. This is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.